I need to explain that part of this session is a little bit hands-on and Sanyin will explain as he goes, but um, there'll be times when you might want to follow along with some of the code that he's doing. Uh, we don't expect you to sort of follow along because it's quite difficult to do that in a webinar setting to like copy out all the code that he's doing, but Sanyin will provide you with links so that you can sort of uh, have a look at some of the code he's working on and, and if you want, you can tinker with it a bit yourself. And we will provide, uh, you know, the links and everything at the end and the slideshow will be put up with the recording when we put that up. So without further ado, I'll introduce Sanyin Dedic. Uh, Sanyin is a robotics engineer and an experienced educator in the field of Digitech. Um, he now works as a, is an e-learning leader. Is that the title, Sanyin, at, at your school? Teacher at King David School, yes. At King David. So uh, yeah, welcome Sanyin and thanks for, uh, for being Thank here. Thank you everyone. Um, before I start, I'll just uh, let me know if you see the tab where it says coding sentimental chatbot in Python and Digitech Hub. Uh, Nathan, just give me a thumbs yep. up. That's what yep. you see. Well, uh, I'd just like to show you this. This is going to be sent to you as a follow up uh, to the webinar. This is a, a brief webinar uh, that's all about this uh, learning sequence that's up on the Digitech Hub that um, I've created in the summer. So there are 12 tutorials, there's some exercises going along, essentially taking you step by step into creating a chatbot in Python that uses some natural language processing and senses emotion. So if this whole experience turns out to be a little bit fast, there is a really slow step by step free online course that's on the Digitech Hub that's going to help you take that's going to help take you through this. Now into the webinar. So here's what we're going to be doing. Nathan, if you don't mind, uh, do you want to just show us your face? Because I'd like to interact with you as we go along. No worries, I'll keep my face on. <laughs> awesome. Um, so the first thing we're going to cover is some history of chatbots and artificial intelligence. It turns out that the concept of artificial intelligence, computers, and the the concept of a chatbot really have the genesis in the same 10 year period involving this genius called Alan Turing. Then we're gonna look at what chatbots do today in 2020 and their ever increasing role in our technological landscape. The third thing we're gonna do is some hands-on coding. So we're gonna go through that learning sequence, a program at a time. You're not going to copy the code as Nathan said from scratch, but you'll have links where you can in literally one click, open up the code that I'm using and tinker and play with it and basically see what it does and interact with the, the chatbots yourself. Okay, let's begin. So history of chatbots and how did we get here? Well, it turns out um, the very first uh, very powerful computational machine was used to break the Nazi uh, secret communications code. It was started by a number of Polish mathematicians, way, made its way into England, and Alan Turing was the person that brought it to a level of higher efficiency. And in that process, with the other people he was working with, the, the general concept of what a computer is came along, the Turing test, and the Turing machine as well. So after that, we got into the 80s and a chatbot in, in essence was the most popular game in the world. And in the 90s, we became, we, we had these competitions of chatbots that had the goal of being conversational. So essentially like passing a Turing test. Let's go through that a little bit step by step. So in 1940, uh, this machine was developed. The, the name is actually inherited from the Polish mathematicians. So the very first powerful computational machine was uh, trying to solve a complex puzzle involving language and the shifting of letters. So this is really where Alan Turing cut his teeth going from pure maths into computational machines. Eight years later, he outlines this concept that has changed the world we live in permanently because this, uh, the Allen, sorry, the Turing machine, which is defined in this diagram is what we're all using to communicate to each other. Essentially, it says uh, a machine that takes ones and zeros, an infinite tape of ones and zeros as input and manipulates those ones and zeros according to some rules, putting out ones and zeros as output, can solve 
an enormous range of mathematical problems, an enormous range of general problems. So right now, like whether it's the camera that's recording me or whether I'm typing into a keyboard, um, this computer is receiving a stream of ones and zeros and then putting out ones and zeros on the other hand as coordinate locations of pixels on a screen. And that's what every computer phone and everything else does. So this was defined in 1948 by Alan Turing. And I've got a little video here from a YouTube channel called Computer File that describes the Turing machine. So we're going to, Nathan, if you hear it, just give me a thumbs up so that I know we're not playing. Okay, full here. The way Turing yep, describes these machines goes like this. You have a way of writing down information in a coded form. His way was to think of a tape, which is as long as it needs to be. It's divided up into squares. And on each of these squares, there's either a one or a zero, or we can have some spaces. Now, what our machine does is it looks at the tape one square at a time. So you could imagine it as a little box running above the tape, maybe on little wheels, looking one square at a time. And that information codes up a question or a problem that we want solved. What the Turing machine does is really simple. At any moment in time, it's in a particular state and it's looking at one square on the tape. And it has a logbook, a program book, and that tells it if, for instance, you're in state number 23 and you're looking at a zero, then rub out the zero, change it to a one, move one square to the right, and move into state number 359, for instance. Or if you're in state number 359 and you're looking at a one, leave that one as it is, move one square to the left, and move into state number 20. Really simple instructions. What the machine does is it starts off with a certain pattern of ones and zeros. It follows these rules one square at a time, transforming that string of one and zeros into a different string of ones and zeros. And eventually, hopefully, the machine moves into a halting state. It's finished, it's done. And what's left on the tape is the answer to our problem, coded up as ones and zeros. That is such a simple process, but it turns out it's the essence of computation. Whatever any computer can do, it could in theory be done by that system looking at ones and zeros on a tape. So, yeah, I find that, I find that fascinating that someone could basically define what it would take to, to create a computer that can solve thousands of different problems that would be programmable essentially uh, a, a system that takes in ones and zeros puts out ones and zeros and has a bunch of rules and these rules themselves are actually uh created via programming languages so that's what we do and they're in themselves encoded in ones and zeros now by 1950 um we did not yet have a single computer that was the same general computer that turing defined but Turing had already defined what an intelligent computer would be. So he creates this thing called uh, imitation game. So this is the Turing test. He actually called it imitation game. Other people have nicknamed it as a Turing test. And the imitation game basically states that, okay, you have a human talking to two entities that we are exchanging text messages with. So just like you would have a text chat via on your phone or on Facebook or WhatsApp or whatever. Um, the, the thing is, one of the entities he's communicating with is a computer, the other is a human. And so if the person C doesn't know who's human and who's a computer when it comes to A and B, then we have achieved artificial intelligence. So he basically defined this within the time frame of inventing the framework for what a computer is. And we had a Turing test. We had this benchmark before we even had proper programmed computers that used programming languages. Now, the first sort of inkling of us arriving at a real artificial intelligence, a chatbot which exhibits artificial intelligence, was in the 1980s. I know that back in the day, Nathan played this game. It's called Zork. 
Uh, I'd like to, to know in the chat if anybody else played Zork. Uh, Zork was essentially a chatbot leading a game of Dungeons and Dragons. So you would um, interact with it. So it had a, the most advanced text parser at a time, which is just essentially a program that um, makes sense of different types of text that the person can put in. So it would say you're in an open field west of a big house uh, with a boarded front door. There's a small mailbox here. And you could say, open the mailbox. Looks like a bit like Transylvania. Yeah. Open the mailbox or open it or what's inside. What was special about Zork is that it felt like you were talking to a person because you wouldn't have to be so, so prescriptive in what you said. You could say 50 different things and it would recognize most of them correctly. So. The other thing that I suppose is also very surprising is how could a game that has nothing but text turn out to be the best selling game of an entire decade and launch, you know, one of the biggest companies in gaming, which is Activision. So that, that in itself showed something, one that chatbots are, are engaging and strangely compelling, even at an age where we already had games with graphics. Now, this was the 1980s. At the time of Zork, people were making predictions that we're going to pass the Turing test by the year 2000 because relative to what existed in the 70s, Zork was such a big breakthrough, but that pace didn't last. However, in the 90s, we had this competition called the Leibner Prize. And the Leibner Prize uh, resulted in, in the creation of a number of, of chatbots that are quite famous that you could play with today, you could chat with, with your students. In this bit.ly, which will be attached in the resources, you see some transcripts. The whole idea in Leibner Prize is that different people enter their chatbot and people chat to either people or chatbots. So they perform Turing tests and they hand out a prize to the test that was the most convincing. By most convincing, spent the highest number of seconds before the human chatting with it was convinced that this was actually a computer. And currently the performances of these um, have all been sub two minutes. So within two minutes, you can always recognize that you're talking to a computer. The only one that went beyond two minutes was pretending to be a 13 year old Ukrainian boy who barely speaks any English. So unless like, unless the chatbot is pretending not to be intel, like not to actually be properly a native English speaker, um, it's never lasted beyond two minutes. And the benchmark they're going for, actually they're going for two, five and 10 minute benchmarks. Now you can actually chat with these. Um, I'll send the links in, 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 the, in the chat and the follow-up email. You can just follow them right here. So the re what's interesting with these, and I, I like to have discussions when I teach students about chatbots, I, I get them to spend about five minutes on each. Mitsuku is a rule-based chatbot. So Mitsuku is a collection of tens of thousands of if-else statements and lists and, and databases. So it's entirely trained by people. Whereas Cleverbot is more of a machine learning based chatbot that responds based on its previous human interactions. And surprise, surprise, actually Mitsuku has outperformed Cleverbot regularly in the Leibner Prize competitions. But I think Cleverbot as a project is a lot more interesting. Uh, in fact, a lot of people believe that if people were actually paid to talk to Cleverbot with real seriousness and not to joke around with Cleverbot, because if people goof around and Cleverbot basically uses that to train itself to then give totally random and silly responses. But if people seriously talk to Cleverbot for several million interactions, uh, we would be a little bit closer to regularly passing that two minute mark. So um, in terms of what modern chatbots do, like 2020, well, there's some interesting things you can do. Uh, you can order a pizza by describing the pizza that you like. You want know, like a slightly thicker crust with some anchovies and, and tomatoes and whatever, whatever you want. And the Nobino's pizza chatbot is going to assemble the pizza of your dreams. There are real estate apps that do the very same thing where you describe your dream house and the, the chatbot produces a short list of properties for sale or rent that match the criteria. So all of that is much like Zork. It's text parsing, it's analysis. And you're going to see this uh, more and more when you go onto websites 
there are chat bubbles that pop up. And these are chatbots that, again, direct you to the most relevant page or perhaps put you in touch with the most relevant person on the website. So chatbots are actually having more and more uh, practical applications in the digital economy, and yet they're not making that much progress in terms of impersonating people better. However, when it comes to impersonating people better, we may not be able to last past two minutes, but we've certainly managed to do what we used to do in text to do that with voice interactions. So I'm sure a lot of people here would have talked to, um, you know, Google Assistant, Amazon Alexa, Apple Siri. And the next couple of videos I'm going to show you are from Google Duplex. Now you can download Google Duplex on your Android. I think you can download it on your Apple device. And what Google Duplex does is makes reservations for you. So in the background, while you say, I want to book this restaurant between seven and eight, something magical happens, something that within the bounds of this narrow interaction would actually pass a Turing test. Let's have a listen. So let's go back to this example. Let's say you want to ask Google to make you a haircut appointment on Tuesday between 10 and noon. What happens is the Google Assistant makes the call seamlessly in the background for you. So what you're going to hear is the Google Assistant actually calling a real salon to schedule the appointment for you. Let's listen. Oh, how can I help you? Hi, I'm calling to book a woman's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm-hmm. Sure, what time are you looking for around? At 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 1.15. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like, what service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's her first name? The first name is Lisa. Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. Have a great day. Bye. You know, if, if there was no video accompanying that, I think everyone would have a hard time figuring out who's the human and who's the chat, but, and they've got a number of these digital agents. The next one's a shorter video, but the next one is also, So let's go. yeah, the next one's, uh, going to try to deal with a situation where the restaurant itself won't accept the booking. So let's check this one out. Maybe another example. Let's say you want to call a restaurant, but maybe it's a small restaurant, which is not easily available to book online. The call actually goes a bit differently than expected. So take a listen. See how may I hear you? Hi, um, I'd like to reserve a table for Wednesday the 7th. For seven people? Um, it's for four people. Four people when? Today, um, tonight? Wednesday at 6 p.m. Oh, actually, we live here for like upper like five people. For few, four people, you can come. How long is the wait usually to uh, be seated? For when tomorrow or weekday or? For next Wednesday, uh, the seventh. Oh no, it's not too busy. You, you you can come for four people, okay? Oh, I got gotcha. you. Thanks. Yeah. Bye-bye. You know, in the future, Nathan, if you and I got to meet, I think my chatbot's going to call your chatbot and they'll yeah, have a no, bit of negotiation. <laughs> it's, uh, th this whole area of kind of AI and human interactions is really interesting. There's actually quite a bit of other stuff on the Digitech Hub coming up too about AI and and also provided by, by a few others like CSER. So AI is a really interesting context for digital technology students to, to look at, not just coding, 
but also impact like society and and uh, those sorts of issues, which are also part of the Digitech curriculum. So, yeah. Hmm. Now, it's worth saying that a vast majority of these advanced artificially intelligent chatbots are actually programmed in Python. So Python sort of the language of choice for natural language processing. And the interactions that you heard still happen uh, with conversion of voice to text, text to voice. So the computer, the chatbots that are choosing these responses are thinking and processing and outputting in terms of text. So when, when you are doing programming with chatbots where they basically chat with you via text, it's very, very much the very same program could easily be uh, adopted to work via speech interactions. And I think that, you know, in the very near future, I would say the next five years, there are probably going to be built in uh, machines that just convert uh, text to speech in two way communications with chatbots. I think that's going to be built into IDEs. So, in terms of what else, why Python? Well, Python is really, really, uh, well, it's the easiest programming language to learn for beginners. It's really good with manipulating data, uh, particularly text. And you're about to see all of that in action. So what we're going to go through is essentially that learning sequence that you've seen on the Digitech Hub. I've taken seven consecutive programs, and I'm not going to code any of these from scratch, but each one of them has sort of got extension questions, and I'll discuss each one as to why it's interesting and what to do when students finish early and how we can differentiate. At this point, um, yeah, I would really welcome any questions when I'm in the middle of coding. That's going to be a lot more interactive. Also, the YouTube link in the chat. Uh, also, if anybody has any questions about anything presented so far, now is a really good time for questions. You can even uh, go ahead and unmute yourself uh, and ask it in voice. I was just going to say, too, um, for those of you who are... The, the whole idea of doing Python or general purpose programming is brand new to you. I will post also some resources uh, in the chat later on. We'll post the link to the course that Sanyin's referring to that he's talking about today, but I'll also post links to a couple of other courses and resources that can help you get started with, uh, with Python. Uh, Alton question there, are databases based on SQL? Well, SQL is a querying language that works with, with databases, but uh, that's, that's quite a different topic from uh, from what we'll be doing today. So I'm going to share um, a Chrome tab. Now, Nathan, as we've discussed, when, when I switch tabs, I might actually be on the wrong program and not on the previous one, et cetera. So I'm counting on your eagle eyes for that. Um, regarding this, everyone, every time I go into a program, I'll send you a link. Now, if anyone can go into the chat, You'll notice there's a link there sent from me. You can click on it and you can just open up the code that I have on the screen. Um, you can also type in this bit.ly and get access to the interactive version of the code that I have. So you may not be able to, uh, we're not gonna do anything from scratch. You don't need to really code along, but you can open up this program and try it out yourself. So I'm going to now discuss uh, a series of, um, I think I've got six programs. Uh, and yeah, so the first one, I often start with a Python program that plays around with nicknames. In fact, the beginning point would be, for example, hello human, how are you, what is your name? And then you could do a statement that does something like, Print, hello, comma. So this is one of the very, very first things I do with students. Sign in, and the program says, hello, sign in. So the next level of this is using a little bit of string manipulation so that you save the variable name right here, but then you create a brand new variable, we call that nickname, and you can 
uh, manipulated in some way. For example, we can create a nickname where we add doctor plus name plus the genius. So I know it's a bit corny, so I'm gonna use Nathan for it and not myself. Ella, what is your name? Nathan, I will call you Dr. Nathan the genius. Well, that's fair enough. I'll, I'll, I'll help you with that. Good. Uh, well, generally speaking, uh, a lot of schools do Python at uh, year seven. I mean, we are supposed to do text-based coding starting from basically all of secondary school. So year seven, but it depends on, it depends on schools. Some schools have only got electives at year seven. Um, okay. So once you've, once students have done this, uh, one of the first extension activities is create your own nickname. So it doesn't have to be doctor. It could be something else. Like, I mean, if you've seen Grok and you've done the basic, that I think the exercise goes something like a McFace or something like that. And if, if I say, what is your name? And we say, Bob, I'll call you McBobface. But if, if uh, your students handle that really quickly, then there are a few, um, a few string segmentation um, tricks that you can teach them. And this is only sort of for extension kids while everybody else is catching up. So for example, name minus one is the very last character of the name. So if I say sign in here, and if we say, I'm not sure if, if this is going to work in the um, in the interactive shell, but yeah, so it does. That's the very last letter. Uh, so you could create a nickname which uses the last letter of the name and then add the Y. You creating, you know, a very, very common way we give nicknames. So let me show you what I mean by that. Um, I'll call you Tommy. Call you Johnny. Although I'm not sure that Simon or Nathan works pretty well, but anyway. So that is, that's a very good place to start. It doesn't use any loops. It doesn't use any if statements. Um, you're only using a Python print statement. And if they're trying to introduce some brand new concepts, they're only ever doing it on one line of code, which is easy to sort of fix and troubleshoot. And it's probably a pretty good place to start. So next up, share this tab instead. Next up, we try to do a little bit of basic text parsing. So what would a chatbot ask? Maybe it's interested if you human like, if you like computers. So you ask a question, do you like computers? The answer is saved as this, this variable right here. And then we can check if the answer is yes or if the answer isn't yes. So if I do say yes, great, we're gonna get along. And if I say no, I don't like you go away. Except there's quite a few wrinkles to this. Maybe Nathan, you can point some out for the, for the audience. Uh, so, the, this is to do with, I suppose, user experience. When you're, when you're doing software, user experience is a big factor in how well a program works. So if I was to put a capital Y, yes, yep. would that work for me? No. Uh, what, what if I just put a Y? Little Y, big Y, no. You would actually need to put in exactly yes. Mm. But we can handle that. We can handle, um, we can lowercase, now that you brought it up, now we lowercase the answer, right? And at this point, whether you say yes like this or whether you say yes like that, since the answer you've entered gets lowercase before getting checked, we're good. If you wanted to handle Y, you could add, Actually, you could add this, which is almost criminal that this works. Nathan will tell you why and how this should look. But I could say why, great, we're going to get along. How should this look, Nathan? Oh, uh, I mean, Python lets you do that, so I guess it's valid. But Yeah, 
yeah, it'd be nice if you separated into two statements. But so generally speaking, you want uh, entirely complete, uh, you know, conditions. Whether this is this is a conditions like an expression that evaluates that evaluates the true or false. So this is them complete, and this would look pretty much the same way whether it's JavaScript, Python, C, or or anything else. You may not have a colon. You'll have the curly braces, but yeah. So this is a, a one of the elements that I try to make sure that um, I don't teach too many of the Python shortcuts because it's better to teach Python in a way that applies to other languages as much as possible. Another general principle: um, I could have even written input dot lower here. But I really, really try to do uh, one thing with one line of code, especially say in the first 10 hours of, of teaching coding, because then what does line five do has only one answer and not two. And, and, and so like if, if you reduce the complexity uh, so that one thing happens in one line, I think the programs are easier to follow for beginners. So, okay, so now we can say yes or why, but like, what about, Yes, I love them. This brings up another wrinkle, right? Oh my God, uh, you know, not only is it yes, it's even more than yes, and yet this doesn't parse it correctly. Um, so one of the next things that you can that you can change would be, for example, instead of checking if the answer is exactly yes, you could check if, Yes is in the answer. And this is quite intuitive. When kids see this, and this is a tricky one because if, if you check if the Y is in the answer, you could say, I absolutely hate them. And then Y is inside that answer. And, and what you have is, you know, uh, a technical decision in terms of, well, what's more likely in, in terms of what a user is going to do. But now you can actually say, yes, I love them. And we're going to get along. The other thing that, you know, at this stage of teaching, you can illustrate is what an if elif statement is. So you might want to handle no, right? So you might want to do something like this. You'd copy this line of code and go, well, 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 we can do no as well, right? If no is in the answer, and then we can tell the user to go away. But if the answer isn't yes or no, then you could say something I don't understand. Now I've seen students actually put up this code structure so many times and they expect this is going to work perfectly. But of course there are wrinkles to this. Yes, great, we're going to get along and I don't understand. Stand. So what, what this does is, is sort of set, sets us up to, to really understand the purpose of the else if statement. Because, oh my God, I don't have annotations. I've been used to Zoom. Essentially, what you're looking for here uh, is a fork, something that does one of three things. And if you change the if to elif, then what happens is only one of these three is going to get printed. And the question of which one, well, the first one that is true is going to get printed. And if neither of these two are true, then the else is going to get printed. And now what you have is, is really something that makes sense. Like you'll either, even if I say, no, I, Even if I was to say something like, I love computers, it would just say, I don't understand, which is a better way to handle it than to uh, tell me to go away because I didn't match the yes perfectly. So all of a sudden, um, from this simple if else statement that checked if the answer is yes, we are already trying to intelligently parse the answer to a question and this typically would take me about half an hour with students and, and where you arrive really is a point where it is almost impossible to catch everything. 
but you can basically catch a majority of the answers that could come up. So um, in the learning sequence, this if something is in statement is a separate tutorial. Oh, share this tab instead. I suppose, um, I suppose that you could add lists to it. So you could create a list of positive words. And if the user response is one word, you could check if that word is inside a list of positive words. But more or less what we did here in the previous, sorry, what we did in the previous program um, handles, again, most possible responses. So I think I'm gonna just hold on here for a second and just see if people have uh, any questions. Yes, can you check for types? So can you elaborate on that, Nathan? Oh, yes. Yeah. So Alton was asking about whether you can write functions that can help you check if something's characters or numbers or things like that, which you oh, definitely yeah, yeah. can in Python. Yeah, 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 yeah. You can basically like do something like if and dot is, I don't know if this is capital or not, is numeric, right? So that, that for example, would check if the answer is made out of numbers. And uh, then you could do some sort of a print statement saying, uh, why are you typing in numbers? So if you were to just uh, search Python string methods, you would find about a hundred different things you could put after the dot of a string that check whether, you, how long it is, whether it's made of characters, is it alphanumeric, is it both, is it... Um, so that's actually, I think there's no capital in it. Well, it could be is number, not sure. Or is alpha, um, I'm going off of memory here. It could be is alpha. Yeah, why are you typing in numbers? It is is numeric, it looks like that. So yes, um, I think in the, uh, in the learning sequence of the chatbot, there is a worksheet with about 20 or so string functions where you know you can use that as a reference to try uh, different things. What I might just do, Sanyin, uh, before we go on is, I'm just gonna paste into the chat the link to the, to the learning sequence for people who oh, just wanna yeah. check it out already. Um, so I'll just put that in here. Um, and then Cam was saying in, in Zork, so the parser, how did it work? Was it just searching for keywords like use and key? I think that's right. It would have been looking for those keywords and then um, attempting so, to, yeah. It was a combination of this and lists. So Ooh. instead of just checking these manually, uh, if you did short answers, it would break them down and check. Uh, it would have a list of words that indicate that something should be open. So you would just look up whether the words in your text match the list of words that are associated with opening. It would have a list of words for going right, whether that is east, west, or whatever in that particular instance, a list for going left, straight. So it operated much like this with the assistance of lists of words. Okay, so hopefully this thing is going to load. And if our goal is, uh, as mentioned uh, before, like the chatbots that are mostly used today are eminently useful, but they lack in randomness. Like people ask the same question a hundred different ways and depending on how they're feeling or if they're relaxed or in a rush, they'll form longer and shorter sentences, whether you're a friend or not. So I think, one thing that we want to add to chatbots is an element of randomness. And the way you can do that is a really, really neat application of lists. So right here is a list of greetings. How are you? Greetings, human, tell me about your disposition. How, hi there, how's it going? And you can add another one. And I'm, Nathan, give me a string that says, how are you? I'm not feeling... Uh, creative. Uh, 
Just how's it going? How is it going? Well, you can, using this random library, simply print a random choice. And then when you read it, like students look at this code and they will tell you what it does. By the way, uh, before I even press run on these, when I teach these programs, I'm always asking students for predictions. And I find that when it comes to these text manipulating functions and when it comes to sort of like random.choice and lists, they're really quite intuitive. So right now I play that. It's installing text blob. I don't know why. I guess it's it was used in a previous version of, program, of the program, but it will simply print a random choice. If I run it twice, it'll most likely print some other greeting. It did what's up twice. So hi there, how's it going? Hello, how are you? What's up? So at a basic interaction, you can you could say hello 10 different ways. All of a sudden, that's that's got the randomness. And in the very, very next tutorial, we are going to look at measurement of polarity, which is sort of the AI element. I'll explain how it works in a minute. But you can also, one of the extension questions for students is to go back to a previous program and recycle this structure to handle the answer to the question of how are you? So you could check if the answer, if the great is inside the answer, if good is inside the answer, if fantastic is. You could try to write some code that handles positive and negative responses and a chatbot could give a considerate response. The reason why I do that is because that's actually not easy. It will not handle more than say 30, 40% of the common responses. And this is where the chatbot polarity comes in. So let me share this tab and let's just, let's just print this because there's no other way. So Sonia, just where we're up to here, we're starting to bring in now a module text block mm -hmm. and it's, it's to do with, this is where the AI kind of comes into the program. Is that right? Yes. So this is, um, so text blob here is, there's a reason for, first of all, this line and the way I imported it. So text blob is a library that contains um, a collection of functions from different libraries that involve text analysis. This particular text blob function has attributes of um, subjectivity and polarity. So this, this particular function from this library can tell the user if a piece of text is emotionally positive, negative, neutral, and also if it's biased or unbiased. Um, this would not, if you were to run this in a normal IDE, it would ask you to install this library. So it's pretty cool that we could do this inside, uh, inside the browser. So th there's no other way to do this other than test it. So I'm really gonna put this in the chat and encourage people to open this link and see what happens when we answer the question. So if you answer a question with 50 words minimum, you're gonna get a score between minus one and one on how emotionally positive or emotionally negative your answer was. Um, minus one is the maximum negative, plus one is the maximum positive. And you'll see how good the algorithm is. I really love Computers, I think they are cool and interesting. So I'll get 0.45. So this is clearly a positive. One is the maximum. Anything close to 0.5 is very positive. If I, if I um, get a negative response, computers are all, that's how you spell awful? Computers are awful. I hate them so much. That's a very negative um, response. Now, uh, a good challenge for students here is, can you defeat the algorithm and you know create 
irony or backhanded compliments. Uh, once you know how the algorithm works, it becomes a bit easier. So basically, uh, text blob is created by this um, natural language studies institute in Belgium called CLIPS. And it has several thousand manual entries, but most of its data is um, generated through the analysis of Yelp reviews. So Yelp reviews are like, that's a popular thing in America and, and you get restaurant reviews and restaurant reviews have stars from one to five. And they've worked out an algorithm that gives associations between the stars and adjectives. So each adjective has a, a level of polarity, a level of emotion. The only one that, the only ones that don't, that have been reset to zero, are ones that have multiple meanings. So also emotive words also have, uh, emotive words also have, uh, sorry, like uh, a polarity score. So if I said I love computers, that would be 0.5. But I like computers is 0.0, because .0, like can, has multiple meanings, right? Um, but you could also say, Good, that's 0.7, very good. So there are, it, it has some qualifiers, that's 0.9 and bad and very bad works. Um, so it, it is a little bit more sophisticated than just having polarity scores for individual words and averaging them. It also has words that act as amplifiers for both positive and negative. But essentially, that's, that's a giant database of all the words in English language where the vast majority of adjectives and a good number of nouns have a polarity score. And they've done studies where they go, how often does this accurately detect human sentiment? It's about 85% on restaurant reviews, about 75 on general statements. So obviously it does a little bit better on the data that it's been trained on. So here's how we can actually turn this into a bit more of an advanced um, chatbot. Let's, so remember how before we had that random choice. Let me just share this tab. You can randomly ask somebody how they're going. In fact, I'm going to copy this, this code in and I'm going to put this into the into here. And then we're going to process the emotion of the answer and give a sensible answer. So I don't think there's anything particularly challenging about this code. I'll just make sure that this works. Import random. Run. So we're going to have answer equals to input, and we're going to say blob equals to text blob of ANS. And we can now ask a question How are you doing? Great. Thank you for asking. So now if you can ask someone. Uh, Senyin, sorry, I think you're yeah. showing the wrong uh, tab at the moment. Mm, it was bound to happen, thanks. So let me just recap. This is the code from the previous uh, program that randomly picks a greeting. This code here analyzes that greeting for emotion. So now we're going to randomly ask, how are you? And we're going to analyze that. And with maybe seven, eight more lines of code, we're going to be able to respond in a sensible way to a question, sorry, to an answer to, to this greeting. And, you know, write a response that's good enough to beat a Turing test, at least for 20 or so seconds. So let's, let's go on and do this. So if we can test if blob polarity, if this were to be greater than 0 
that is extremely positive. You could say something like, well, sounds like you are doing fantastic. And, you know, copy and paste. Next, you can check if it's slightly positive. And you could say, I am glad you are doing. Remember, that's an LF. And then you could do the sort of inverse, check if it's, because it'll check if, the, if, the, if it's the, it will check from top to bottom. So you really want to always check the extreme case first. So you want to check if it's less than negative 0 0.5. Oh no. Ah. And hour of copy and paste, if that was More negative than negative that, more negative. Hmm. Oh. So you don't want to be too upbeat when someone's very negative, just when someone's a little bit negative. It's an emotionally sensitive chat, but the only possibility is a neutral. And then you can print here. Sounds like you are. Okay, so let's, while we're at it, we're handling a uh, very positive, slightly positive, very negative, slightly negative, and neutral. We've never tested neutral. So let's try to use zero adjectives and zero emotive nouns. I am a human being located on planet Earth. Sounds like you are okay, 0, 0.0. So folks, remember that you can use sending this link. Yeah. And you can, you know, how you, how, how are you? Horrible, very horrible day here. Oh no, sorry to hear that, et cetera, et cetera. Now, it, it, can go way beyond just one interaction. You can ask an opinion on a topic. Um, you can ask any question where a, a response could be carried out depending on how emotional that answer is. So I could ask you, what do you think about this webinar so far? And my chatbot will tell me if you like it or not. Um, so it'll even, it can even produce the number of stars for the review, uh, even if you didn't do it. So that's, that's essentially what's available to you with effectively one, three line, within three lines of code, you're adding an element of artificial intelligence and emotional analysis to a program that was previously just a rule-based chatbot. So I would highly recommend everybody to try out this, this library. And by the way, you could try out this chatbot by opening this link right now. Folks, uh, we, we're uh, getting to about five minutes left for the webinar. So mm -hmm. um, Sanyin's taken us through the first five or so parts of the, of the learning sequence. And we'll share again the link to the full learning sequence uh, in, the, in the chat now. But does anyone have any questions? Feel free to put them in the chat um, at this point or any thoughts or, um, yeah. Checking only access, ah, polarity, yes. Yeah, you need a textbook library, Altan, to, to check the polarity. Um, you can also do it via NLTK. Um, if you just search text polarity in Python, um, you're gonna get several different options but NLTK and the textbook are the ones I'm aware of. Um, this is wonderful. I love it every minute. Okay. Well, glad to hear it, Kelly. Thanks, Sanyin and team. Um, I would uh, maybe, just maybe, for the um, final one, 
I'll just show you what you could do if you were to commit to 100 plus lines of code. Um, you could put all of this together and use a Python dictionary to give the chatbot biases. So if randomness and emotion was not enough to make a bot seem human, I think in this world today, uh, adding biases to a computer program would make it uh, feel like, yeah, we're, we're talking to a person here. So Nathan, you could do so, the interactions. Okay, I'll tell you what to type, will I? Do you have a nickname? Uh, Nath. Oh, I should have said yes. Sorry, my <laughs> bad. You're an A Fanny now. Are you well? I am well. This will be neutral because well is, uh, well has basically zero polarity. What's your take on AFL, Nathan? I'm going to, I'm going to pretend to really love it. So I love it. It's fantastic. I love it. It is fantastic. The chatbot doesn't like AFL, by the way. Uh, well, you clearly I like disagree. AFL. I disagree. AFL is worse than that. Also, most people I know think AFL is great. So one thing I added to this is human opinions. So it actually uses something called JSON to log what people think. So every person it talks to, it saves and averages out all of their interactions. Ah, uh, so this is starting, this is what we would call machine learning, right? It's so this is already to... beginning to learn or beginning to be aware of what people think. What do you reckon about Melbourne? You realize what's your take on and what do you reckon about? It's asking you these questions differently every time. Oh, nice. Uh, Melbourne is okay. Is okay. That's strange, but clearly I disagree. Melbourne is worse than that. Also, most people I know think Melbourne is great. How do you feel about Python? Oh, Sanyan, do you want to ask me this? Um, well, let's see what it's, let's see. I, I'm going to say I prefer JavaScript. I prefer Java. I don't know whether it'll- By the way, for, for whatever reason, I decided that polarity zero was negative for this program. And I really should have kept it neutral. So it's going to be very neutral view of Python. And he thinks Python is better than that. Okay. Also, so most of the test interactions have liked AFL, loved Melbourne, disliked Python, because I think most people want to uh, annoy the chatbot. Because if you annoy the chatbot, he leaves with a very, very rude statement. And he will leave early and say, I'm off to watch some paint dry. It'll be more interesting than you. Yawn, I got to go. This is what you get for disagreeing with the chatbot, Nathan. I'm glad it was you, not me. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, that was that's where you could arrive with using um, a little bit of memory in the form of uh, of JSON of the JSON library, and using dictionaries instead of lists, so that it it has an actual value attached to each topic. So that's about it. I mean, I'm, I'm ready to answer any questions. If there are any, you can send them via the, the chat.